lead in the um, all of us own an automobile that has a gauge on it that tells us how many miles to the gallon we're getting and if there's a problem with it okay if it, the light either an idiot light shows up on the dashboard or something shows that says hey we you've got a problem with your car your car burns twenty five hundred dollars worth of gasoline a year okay now maybe it's more important than your chiller because you're not paying the bill for the chiller but the chiller typical chiller is using eight hundred thousand to a million dollars a year and we got nothing on it that tells us whether it's working right or not okay no mile per gallon meter no no kw per ton meter okay um and one of the reasons that we don't uh, one of the prime reasons we don't is because we find it increasingly difficult to put flow meters in chilled water systems because there are not enough straight runs of piping to allow you to put good meters in. So people have tried, they put them in, you know, and then all of a sudden the readings don't mean anything and they get rid of them or they don't maintain them or whatever, it had no value. But Klaus's approach is a, more, a much more engineering approach to looking at the refrigeration cycle. He looks at a pressure enthalpy chart and with the, knowing the temperature of the water entering and leaving, without a flow meter, he will tell you what your flow is. Okay, which is, a, and because we don't have to put in those flow meters, the cost of doing this, the application of this device, is half or a third or even less, 25% of the cost of putting in all kinds of flow meters and instrumentation that you typically see uh, in a uh, chilled water efficiency system. Okay, from that I'm going to pass it on to Klaus. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, John, and very nice to to uh, have an opportunity to speak to all of you. And um, I assume that you have the first slide on yeah. the screen. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So so I mean, our, I started with trying to solve. Uh, issues with uh, the efficiency of heat pumps and the difference between heat pumps and chillers is that people buy heat pumps to save money. With chillers they save them uh, for, for uh, they buy them for, for getting the temperature. So uh, I started with this in, in the mid 80s and since then I've been always uh, uh, focusing on, on efficiency. I've been working with other areas as well uh, in this industry, but I've always kept uh, working with this method. And uh, next uh, picture, please. So I believe that optimization always start with measurement. And uh, I, I agree with John that the traditional methods, they, they do not give us the information we need, we want. And it was mentioned the challenges with flow meters. But on top of that, we are working with small temperature differences, which uh, if you take a small temperature difference, the measuring error becomes uh, very challenging. If you have a large number of chillers in the plant, it becomes extremely expensive to, to uh, work with uh, the accuracy required on flow meters and temperature sensors. And the, the even bigger drawback is that if there's an indication of a problem, you don't know anything of what the problem is. Whereas uh, the approach of going on the refrigeration side, we have a well-defined fluid and uh, we know the properties of that fluid and can work from that. So today we have a full range of, of um, analyzing tools. We have portable systems that can be hooked up to, to basically any air conditioning refrigeration system in 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, and then you have all the information that the test lab of a chiller factory would have. Or we can work with the permanent install and online services we, we monitor 24-7. And we have uh, more than 1,000 systems in the field uh, today. Next, please. And I assume I don't need to tell you this, but there is a huge uh, use of of uh, energy or electricity for, for uh, chillers and refrigeration. So it's a, it's a major sector of energy use and it's getting under more and more attention from the uh, political systems. In next, please. 
I, I also would claim that you, you can save 10 to 40 percent in the existing air conditioning refrigeration plants without major investment. It's very rare that we find systems where you cannot save anything and uh, very also rare that it's not 10 percent. Next, please. And I always uh, face the situation where, where everybody is saying that they agree with that there's a lot of saving potential, but not in my plants. But uh, I would say that uh, even extremely well uh, run plants, when you see more detail, then you also find uh, opportunities to save uh, more. Next, please. Uh, this is a survey that was done by the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, where they looked at 164 systems. And these are um, inspection in connection with uh, turning over the system. So the, the contractor is aware of that there will be uh, an inspection. And they, they seem to presume that everything is working fine, as long as there is no alarms and no, no um, obvious and uh, problems but in uh, in fact they they were uh, very far off uh, in most cases <clears throat> so next please and um, i think that uh, this is the normal uh, situation in plants that they they never reach most plants never reach the factory uh, performance and maybe there are some things adjusted with the commissioning but the commissioning today is is not at the state where it should be. I mean, there is any number of ASHRAE uh, documentation on trying to to upgrade the commissioning process, but I think it's far from from perfect today. And then things happen, and most of them are not uh, detected until you start reaching critical levels and and you get a, a breakdown. Uh, John mentioned the, the, the comparison with the automotive testing systems today. Uh, you can also, I mean, I think Klimacek is like a ECG for, for the air conditioning refrigeration system. We hook up the sensors and uh, we can use them uh, for, for analyzing the, the uh, I mean, all the components in the, in the system. Did you get the ECG? slide yeah we have it okay so sorry if i will uh, okay N next one so if we look at the a, a standard refrigeration process and uh, we would uh, need to use two pressures uh, seven surface temperatures and active electrical input that is what's required to to define the process Next. So um, looking at the flow chart, uh, this would be the location of the sensors. And none of these uh, sensors are strange in any way. Uh, the the HVAC technicians, they work with all these uh, sensors uh, normally. But then, uh, the, the, of course, it's the analyzing based on these that we have uh, taken a new approach to. Next. So with th this measurement, we can uh, use the enthalpy data over the refrigerant. And then what we can do an energy balance over the compressor when we know the electrical input. Uh, this makes it possible for us to get the mass flow of refrigerant. And with the mass flow of refrigerant, we then have all the uh, necessary information to evaluate condenser, evaporator, compressor, and refrigerant uh, flow in the system. Next. And with this, uh, I mean, we can uh, get compressor efficiency, uh, condenser efficiency, evaporator efficiency. We can check the control of the expansion uh, device. We can check the, the, the refrigerant charge in the system. So, so we basically have, I would say, all the information uh, to to get of course this the uh, CUPER or or kilowatts per ton or or uh, capacity uh, and as well as the detail. Next, please. 
and and I think that we we today have a huge amount of experience. We have uh, many hundreds of chillers that are online uh, feeding our servers <coughs> with information every minute, and um, there are thousands and thousands of field inspections that are being done continuously. Next. Other big sectors which is using the same processes is the supermarket. Uh, the, the systems are slightly different, but uh, the process is the same. Next. Heat pumps are, uh, again, the same process and no difference. Uh, the, the, the signs are different, the optimization is different, but uh, the process is the same. Next. So, as mentioned, we work with two concepts. One is the ClimaCheck on site, which is portable systems that are hooked up, connected to uh, normally to a PC, and uh, the analyzing is done on site. Or you can, of course, uh, connect the modem and then send the information to the online services. Uh, but most of the online services is used for, for permanent installs where the uh, data is collected continuously. It can be our, our, our standalone systems or it could be different versions of the integration. And uh, we offer besides the, the, the hardware and software and the online services, we also participate with the customers in, in uh, the different levels of, of analyzing and reporting and support of the uh, optimization process. Next. Um, the, the software or the, the on-site is the, based on a PC software and uh, has templates so the, the technician on-site can hook it up based on the instructions and then everything will be presented uh, without that the user need to know anything about the, uh, the uh, uh, thermodynamics behind it. Next. And compared to traditional commissioning, uh, it's, it's a totally new level of information. And uh, it, it's, it only takes 20, 30 minutes to, to hook it up to a normal system. If we're going to industrial sites so and so on, of course, the, the time to hook it up could be an hour or two. But uh, then uh, the level of information is, is uh, extremely detailed. And for those that are familiar with the thermodynamics, uh, you can easily check what the error of a one degree uh, measuring error would be on the thermodynamic evaluation. And it's going to be very, very small. Whereas if you would work on, on a one degree error uh, on a flow-based system, it would have a major uh, impact. And I think that the big thing is that we open the black box by uh, presenting compressor efficiency, condenser efficiency, evaporator efficiency, charge level in, in the of refrigerant, and uh, the, the expansion device. We, we show all that information that you actually require to know if your system is working fine. So it's not the, it showing good or bad system, it's showing the system is good, because of that, the compressor is so good, condenser is so good, evaporator is so good. So you have all that information. And it does not contain any manufactured data in any way. There is absolutely no um, design data from the compressor manufacturer or anything. On that, I mean, on that, you, you, you can take the information we have, you can enter the, the conditions in the computer software from, from the manufacturer and you can check if the, computer, the compressor is doing exactly what it's intended to. Uh, so so I, I would say it's for commissioning and, and inspections, troubleshooting, the on-site is, is a perfect tool. Next, please. And our templates would have the different tabs where you can show tables, graphs, and flow charts. And also you can enter nominal data and have the differences versus nominal presented dynamically.
There is also uh, indicators in the template uh, in the templates that show if you are deviating from expected values. And of course, we have general templates that would be have broad uh, ranges of, of uh, tolerances. But we also do for some manufacturers, we do a template that are dedicated they're spec specifically for a special model uh, or a range of models. So then the, the tolerances will be very narrow and uh, many times they are identical to the limits set in the uh, production test streaks that we have also supplied to, to some of these manufacturers. So th they would uh, be able to test in the field with the same accuracy and the same um, level of information as in the production test rig. Next. We, we also work a lot with uh, trying to assist the, the person on site with in, I mean, information on what could cause a certain uh, problem. And there is always a balance in this because of I, I certainly try to always advocate that the technicians and engineers on, uh, working with our systems should train and uh, they will become much more professional, much more competent when they're working with a, a measuring system like this. And the measuring system as such will never be perfect. There will always be good judgment from the technician and engineer being very important. So, so we don't try to tell one thing because there are normally more than one possible answer, but we try to guide and pre uh, provide checklists for the person working to avoid that they miss uh, possible causes. And one thing that is very unusual for technicians uh, on, on site, I would say, is to see what's happening in the refrigeration process in gra graphs. And this is changing uh, a lot of the understanding because of the time lag of different uh, uh, sequences is, is quite important for a refrigeration air conditioning process. Next, please. So if we're talking about chillers and larger systems, I think that uh, most of the time ClimaCheck Online is uh, more cost effective uh, because of the high cost of running the, the uh, plants and the high cost of failures and downtime. So uh, as we are analyzing the refrigeration process, uh, we will see deviations very much before they are possible to, to see on the on the secondary side. Next, please. And when you have this level of information, uh, it is possible to, to generate alarms uh, with SMS or email or uh, what what is preferred already when when the, the, the problem is in, in its very early stage and uh, cannot be, be detected on the water side in any way. Next, please. So it, it, in a chiller plant, uh, it's possible to in real time uh, follow the, the performance, the compressor efficiency, and uh, how the different plants operate. Uh, so in, in this case, it's just an example from one of the, 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 the plants that we are monitoring. Uh, there's a, a difference with, with more than 10% on the two first chillers in the performance due to the, the capacity, different capacities at different, uh, or the different performance at different capacities, which is uh, many chillers are very sensitive for this. And uh, with a large number of chillers, one of the things that is very important is to understand the dynamics of this to be able to run them in the best way. Next, and uh, we, we continuously try to provide a, a, a dashboard that is giving the, the highlighting any issues in the plant and also detailing exactly where the issue is. So, so when you have looked at this type of, of uh, dashboard a couple of times, 
it becomes very easy to pinpoint where the problem is and uh, the consequence of, of an optimization uh, process is very easy to follow in the energy graphs that you see in the bottom here. I will show you some examples of that. Next, please. So th this is uh, showing uh, a, a combined chiller heat pump. I mean, it's chiller in the summer and heat pump in the winter that is running at a quite good, it's a quite high performance, not really top of the line, but quite high performance. And uh, you can see at the end of the energy graph at the bottom, how they have been succeeding in, in uh, uh, decreasing the, the energy bars versus the, the predicted consumption. So they will immediately see when they are doing optimization uh, measures if they are giving their uh, desired result. Next. This is an, uh, another uh, view where they have a, a number of chillers at a couple of different stores. And one of them is uh, the three top ones are running. The, the top one is indicating that it has an issue on the condenser. And uh, we can see at the last uh, traffic light that it is the uh, subcooling that is too high. So this uh, chiller is, is overcharged. So it doesn't take many seconds to, to evaluate the large number of chillers uh, to identify when they are deviating from uh, optimum. Next. This is a, a, a large chiller plant where we installed uh, KMAJAC online. And you can see that it's, it's running at the beginning at around 60,000 kilowatt hours per 24 hours. So it's a large chiller plant. And then you see how they suddenly drop um, about one fifth of the, the time scale. They're suddenly dropping uh, the uh, energy consumption per 24 hour drastically. And uh, you can imagine the, the payoff on that over a year. And then they can monitor continuously that they're staying on the, on the uh, lower optimized uh, operation. Next. So this is uh, one of the two uh, plant that was uh, uh, a part of the, the total that you saw before, but also here showing uh, one of the chillers that is uh, running with a poor compressor efficiency. So it's the, the, they immediately see that they need to take action on that. Next. The, this is another, uh, this is a, a supermarket, but also visualizing the how they were running on the, what is the purple curve was the pre-optimization consumption. Then the green curve is after optimization. And uh, it's now they can monitor that they follow the green line and not deviate up again. And next, this is a, a leak uh, showing up as uh, that they are, the energy consumption is increasing, depending on system design. Some some systems uh, are indicating on other parameters, but some systems it's it's mainly on the energy consumption. You can see a, a, a leakage, so we can monitor uh, the on the, almost all systems. We can monitor any leaks with uh, great detail. This is uh, another example where a, a defect compressor was detected and could be uh, could be uh, stopped and could immediately see how uh, the efficiency increased. Next, and we are using uh, uh, this new concept of, of system efficiency index quite a lot 
because of that the kilowatt per ton or, or EER or COP is a very dull tool to discuss efficiency because of if you change your operating condition anything, you change your, your uh, kilowatt per tons. So it's very difficult to, to, to say what is good kilowatt per tons or COP or EAR. But the system efficiency index, it's comparing the, the performance with 100% efficient at the condition the system is working. So it remains almost uh, stable over the whole envelope of, uh, of most systems. So it gives you a very good indicator and then you can break the, the losses up in what is lost on the refrigerant cycle or the compressor or the condenser or the evaporator, which gives you a, a really a, a quick a benchmarking on your whole system, but also the explanation to why you reach a specific total system efficiency index. Next. So this is a, a state-of-the-art water chiller. This is very, very close to what you can achieve. Um, there are a few things you could do to get slightly higher. But if you reach 50% of a 100% efficient system, you're very, very close to, to, to the, the, the limit of today's technology. Next. Yeah, I'm not going to go through this uh, in, in, in more detail. Uh, it is, uh, I mean, I put this in for, for you to have as documentation. There is a, a complete report for anybody who would be interested in, in learning more about this. There is a complete report uh, from the, the Technical Research Institute of Sweden. Um, this concept is also being uh, introduced in Germany and, and UK. And you can, of course, look at the system efficiency index uh, with or without uh, pumps and fans. Uh, next. And then next again. Um, and another, just to mention, another application that is growing rapidly now is the refrigerant retrofit. Because of, as you are most likely aware of the HFC is getting under pressure as being uh, global warming gases. Um, in the chiller sector, it's mainly 134A and uh, 123. For those of you that are working with 404A or 507, the pressure is even higher on those. But there is a lot of work going on on new alternatives, and there are new alternatives on the market and all of these, and uh, a lot of retrofit is starting to take place and the uh, evaluation of the new substances in new system as well. So we, we do a lot of field tests and, uh, and uh, pre and post retrofit and so on, which has become a, an interesting um, use of our systems. Next. I don't know uh, uh, as if you have seen that those, but uh, I mean, the, the phase down schedule for Europe is, is, is drastic as we in, in five years need to cut down to, to about 60% of the uh, CO2 equivalent uh, tons of, of uh, this year's consumption. So it, it is a drastic impact as most of these systems in operation today will be in operation at, tw at 2020 as well. Next. But the, but the, the interesting and good thing is that the new alternatives that are being launched are normally more energy efficient than the, what they are replacing. So I think that there is a, a, a good opportunity to save energy with these retrofits as well. It's some, sometimes it can be cost effective to retrofit for the energy saving. So it's an aspect that should be taken into account when, when you are um, looking at this. This is uh, just an example for uh, from a a test that DuPont did uh, with their new 4049 refrigerant replacing 404A, where the blue is the pre-optimization uh, consumption or power uh, energy profile, and uh, the red is after the retrofit. Next. 
So that was an extremely brief introduction to, to Klimashek. And uh, it is, uh, I would say that uh, we, we have a, a great deal of experience have, having worked with this for, for uh, 30 years next year. Uh, and we work with many of the leaders in, in the industry. So, so I look very much forward to um, get involved in any projects that you would be interested in having uh, evaluated or monitored. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus. Um, to to uh, the system that, that Klaus has put together is is very much an expert system. Okay, um, what he's done is he has taken uh, any excursions from what would be a perfect pressure enthalpy chart for a chiller. And he's assigned any time it goes out from that perfect spot, it assigns the possible things that could cause it, and and based on all of the other readings, uh, what he basically he tell you if you don't have enough refrigerant, he'll tell you if you if you have dirty tubes, he'll tell you if you have if you have uh, low flow, high flow, um, and it comes out not only with the fact that you got an alarm. But what to go look at, and uh, possibly even how to fix it. Um, this is is uh, not quite as 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 sophisticated as as Sky Foundries from, but it's more of an application to a very specific piece of equipment as opposed to the overall system. This product, when married with the the uh, uh, Sky Foundry, Sky Spark, um, would make for a, a system that would really uh, tell you what to do, when to do it, uh, and you could even keep histories of what's been done and hasn't been done uh, to, to nail it down a little bit more. What's nice is you can buy it as a service. You can permanently install a unit with software and tie it into your building automation system. You can just buy a service where, from a service contractor where you permanently install the sensors on your unit uh, and then you just come with a box, hook it up, it's hooked up for a week. That information gets transferred back to, to Sweden where it gets analyzed and you get a report every month of what the situation is on your chiller. So it's very, very flexible. Um, we're looking at, at hardware, software, engineering being something less than $15,000 for the first chiller and, uh, and then the cost of the sensors to do the second chiller. So it's very reasonably priced. Quite frankly, you couldn't buy a, a condenser water and chilled water flow meter for what this thing cost to install. Okay. If you're willing to do your own installation, you can keep your, your local three costs down. If not, then you're looking at uh, probably another ten, ten thousand dollars to install it if you have to have to do it. But quite frankly, it's all volt, low voltage. It's all uh, three, four wire platinum tipped RTDs and four to twenty milliamp transmitters. So there's nothing that says that this thing needs to be, uh, and it all hooks up to existing spots on your on your chiller. Okay. So you don't have to, uh, you don't have a lot of welding and, and whatever to, to keep up with. Okay, um, I find this is is a uh, a lot less expensive than some of the the more uh, uh, sophisticated or chilled chilled water flow based systems as opposed to enthalpy cycle, and this actually doesn't require uh, the instruments have to be good quality instruments and platinum RTDs that don't drift, but the errors that occur from the instruments in making these calculations are a lot less than you would get from a chilled water uh, uh, flow type, type of system. I mean, a one degree error on a chilled water system is 10%. So, so if you're dealing with the best match temperature sensors 
that you can buy, you're talking about uh, 2% error right away, a tenth of a degree on each sensor. So you're looking at a 2% error right away before you ever get started. And then the flow meter is another 2%. So you're looking at, a, at, at minimum 4% accuracy if everything was dead on, which is not like, even the flow meter says it's 2%. If it doesn't have 10, 10 and five pipe diameters, it's not even close. And, and remember, we're, we're dealing with 16-inch lines, so 10 pipe diameters is, is 20 or 30 pipe diameters is a long, a long distance, okay, for straight runs. So um, uh, that's been, over my years of looking at chill water plants, that has always been the big problem associated with, uh, with uh, putting in a, a, an efficiency monitoring system in a chill water plant, was getting the right flows. Um, and I know I've seen people put, I've done it myself, put differential pressure transmitters and pray that the manufacturer's data is right. Okay. But that's, uh, you know, as far as pressure drop is across the machine. But then that, now that we've gone to variable flow systems, they can't use that anymore. So um, if you have a steam turbine, you're going to have to buy, you're going to have to, you have the price of a, of a steam flow transmitter. Uh, which you're still going to need your 10 and 5, okay? But they have insertion vortex flow meters from GE uh, for steam that will keep your cost down on a on a steam flow meter, okay? Um, so uh, I uh, like to thank everybody for coming. We have uh, literature up here. I'd like everybody, if they would, to. If you haven't done it already, I probably should have said this this morning when we had more people, but um, if you could just leave us your email, we'll make sure that you get copies of each one of these presentations or a link to where you can download a copy of the presentation, okay? And if there's anything that we can do to help you in your plants, we'd be uh, uh, more than happy to, to come in. Thank you very much.